So Kerry has asked me to bring some of the, the research and data from international jurisdictions who have legalised assisted dying so that after today, when you're having conversations with your friends and your family, you have some rebuttals to what we are hearing from the opposition. So I'll start with just a, a quick rundown. So there are now tens of countries throughout the world and hundreds of millions of people who have access to legalised assisted dying. This proposal that Liam is bringing is probably most closely tied in terms of the criteria, the safeguards and the framework to what has been passed in the US states and in Australia. And at last count, there were 10 US states, including Washington, California, Hawaii and New Jersey, who had assisted dying statutes. So Oregon was the first jurisdiction um, to pass it via a citizen's initiative in 1997 by a slim majority of 52%. Since then, there have been a number of unsuccessful attempts to repeal it, but it does enjoy strong public and political support. Um, and in over 20 years, there have been no cases of abuse. Uh, just to say that I will refer to particular studies um, throughout this, and I was going to bring a handout, but I think it's best if you just let me or Kerry know if you want any of um, the sort of data in here, and then we can send you that over in an email. Um, in Australia, the Northern Territory was the, the first law that was explicitly um, passed, and there, this was in 1995. There was outrage and the federal government swooped in and overturned it. And as of yesterday, I think, now all six Australian states have legalised assisted dying. It's important to point out that I am referencing countries that have assisted dying laws as in actual legislation and statutes. Um, countries who have passed it, for instance, Oregon via a citizens initiative, which is a sort of referendum. And I'll come on to those who have done it through the courts. What happened in Australia and the Northern Territory back in the 90s couldn't happen here in Scotland because this is a devolved issue. So, for instance, the UK Parliament um, couldn't sort of swoop in and overturn this bill if it were passed. And again, we have Jeremy Purvis back in the early 2000s to thank um, very much for firmly establishing that for us. New Zealanders also have access to it, as do Canadians, people in Spain, Portugal, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg and Switzerland. And I'll come on to those latter countries I mentioned there in a bit more detail later because they are most commonly used um, by the opposition um, in arguments around slippery slopes and the erosion of safeguards. So on what basis do these countries have assisted dying? It varies greatly. Some have went on the basis of terminally ill people only. Others include criteria for the person to be unbearably suffering. Others have time limits, etc. Um, it varies hugely throughout the world. Germany and Austria also have it by court order, although that's not yet been implemented, and I'll come on to that now. So our parliament is sovereign in Scotland, so reform, law reform can't come via the courts, but where it has come via the courts, for instance, in Canada and the Netherlands, we find that the laws there are much broader than when they've been passed through parliament. And that is because the judiciary um, basically established, they look at human rights and constitutional rights, which do lend um, themselves to allowing assisted dying for a broader set of people. However, when you legislate outright for something, as most US states have, Australia have, and that's what we're attempting to do here, the parliamentary scrutiny that is afforded to the law prior to implementation means that they are a bit tighter. So that isn't me saying that that's been because it's what has been politically possible to get through. It's more that the democratic process and the thoroughness involved in that, like consultation stages that we're in at the moment, committee scrutiny and the applicability of proposals in that country's context means that laws are drafted with a lot more consideration um, rather than a court looking at one particular case in front of them on the basis of um, the European Convention, for instance. Still, the principles behind assisted dying laws, however they have been passed, whether it's the courts, a referendum through the, the parliaments, um, principles behind are, as Liam's mentioned, choice, autonomy, dignity and compassion for people at the end of life. So what can we learn from jurisdictions? And I'm going to focus on um, good practice and what I suppose the opposition would call bad practice. And the first thing I'll come to is consent competency and coercion. 
So most countries start with the fact that there has to be a written voluntary request from the person. And under this proposal, um, two doctors would assess that capacity independently, um, including any reasons or motivation that the person has for having the assisted death. We would make sure that all other care options had been explored. That doesn't mean that the person has to accept that, but we have to have had that conversation. Um, and there's referral, if, there's a, if it's necessary and appropriate for referral to be made on to other services, whether that's health and social care, then that's built in as well. So the first claim by opponents is that competency and the detection of coercion cannot be properly deduced by healthcare practitioners. But we know that doctors assess capacity daily and are ready au fait with detecting coercion in other end of life situations such as the refusal or the withdrawal of treatment. The BMA and the Association of Palliative Medicine provide statements on this and the Royal Colleges um, of Psychiatrists and Psychologists are adamant in that competency is presumed unless otherwise proven. We already have established laws in Scotland that deal with capacity. We have the Adults with Incapacity Act, which gives us a step-by-step -step framework on how we assess capacity, both in medical, legal and other situations. That was one of the first laws passed by the Scottish Parliament and it's enjoyed um, widespread support. The next claim is that consent can always be obtained and apparently this is evidenced by jurisdictions with obligatory reporting falling foul of this. And I'll come on to this shortly in terms of, of reporting, but it's really not borne out by the data. Bear in mind that the current end of life practices we have with double effect and terminal sedation have no consent requirements whatsoever built in and are often done on two people. However, we do know that once laws are passed, appropriate training for healthcare practitioners and a general public awareness campaign is necessary. For instance, in the Netherlands, a state-funded programme called Support Consultation on Euthanasia in the Netherlands trains physicians to be consultants and provides doctors with advice and support. Now, once our law is passed here in Scotland, it becomes um, proper healthcare, which means that we all have a legal right to, to access it. So it may be that medical training, um, assisted dying is incorporated into medical training, um, or it would be provided by um, people to healthcare practitioners who opt in to take part in that process. And on that note, you'll see in the consultation that we have the fact that conscientious objection or an opt-out clause for healthcare practitioners who don't want to partake um, is something that's very much at the forefront of our mind. And that a register of willing practitioners um, is developed. And this brings me on to the third claim by opponents that doctor shopping is happening in jurisdictions with assisted dying. And at best, this is an exaggeration because we all already do this in some capacity, whether it's choosing which surgeon had does our operation, which GP to see, and which dentist that are our chosen surgeries. Healthcare is a reciprocal arrangement. It's a two-way street, and the NHS constitution gives us a right, albeit a limited one subject to resources, to have a say in who partakes in our own health and social care. We need to stop thinking of assisted dying as something that's so out of the ordinary because in jurisdictions that have passed it, it sits within healthcare alongside other end of life options almost seamlessly. And I know that Sorsha is going to come on um, in a bit more detail about the impacts of laws passing on palliative and end of life care more generally. Um, but I would stress that this proposal sits alongside, not in contest with, efforts to continue the development of palliative and other end-of-life care. So uh, getting back to reporting and monitoring, that takes me to the fourth claim, which relates to non-compliance with reporting and monitoring in jurisdictions who have legalised assisted dying. Of all the laws throughout the world that I looked at, they all have robust monitoring and reporting systems. And this is where I'll start to bring in jurisdictions like Belgium, the Netherlands and, and Netherlands and Canada, because that's most often used by the opposition. Belgian law is monitored by the CFCEE, where less than 1% of cases have been reported to the prosecutorial authorities. In Oregon, it's the Oregon Department for Human Services, and less than 1.96 sorry, 1.96% of all reported deaths have non-compliance. 
But when we start to unpack the reasons for this, it's almost exclusively of a clerical nature. So that might be where the, um, the witness form hasn't been filled out properly or where the doctor has submitted the paperwork late. So in some jurisdictions from the death, the healthcare practitioner has one month to submit the paperwork. They might have a busy week. They might then go on a two or three week holiday. So it's almost exclusively of a clerical nature. A study published in the BMJ showed that in Belgium, most non-reporting physicians don't perceive their act as assisted dying, and that's why they do not report it as such. Which, if we draw comparisons again with the situation here just now, there is other end-of-life assistance that we receive, that our citizens receive, that there's no reporting in terms of double effects, terminal sedation, withdrawal, removal of treatment. So I suppose that's the, that's the first issue, is that the sort of hyperbole around non-reporting, um, really, when you break it down, isn't, isn't borne out. So we haven't actually settled, again, if you have a look at the consultation, we haven't settled on who that reporting and monitoring body should be in Scotland, but we are asking for views on it. And we are in conversation with the Office of the Public Guardian, National Services Scotland and others. Kerry had asked me to look at the claim, I'll call this claim five, that rates of suicide increase in jurisdictions where assisted dying is, is legalised and the lack of evidence here speaks for itself. So I could only find one study from 2017 that suggested increased rates of suicide were linked to assisted dying. And opponents have said this is because of increased positive media attention around assisted dying, which translates to more suicides. But it really, again, once you break it down, it comes back to the way that those countries label assisted dying. So some file it under their ordinary suicide statistics, hence the increase in suicides. Others quite sensibly consider it quite separate and have the underlying health condition that the person is dying of on the death certificate. And then again, a great deal of work and thought has gone into this for Scotland. And it's likely that the terminal illness that the person is dying of will feature on the death certificate opposed to assisted dying, both for privacy reasons um, and public health considerations around resource allocation, because we still need to know how many people are dying from traditional suicide um, and of heart disease, cancer, etc. The sixth claim is that rates of assisted dying are soaring in jurisdictions where it has been legalised. In fact, it forms a tiny percentage of all deaths. Aggregated data has shown us that countries with broader criteria, such as assisted dying and euthanasia, and allowing it for non-terminal people, have seen their figures rise more substantially than um, people who allow assisted dying for terminally only. And this is why rates in the likes of Belgium and the Netherlands um, are higher than Oregon, for example. Still, the rates across the board are between 0 0.3 and 4.6. The increase in Switzerland is partly because so many people are travelling there to have assisted deaths because they, they can't access it in their own country. And again, in Switzerland, it's not explicitly for people who are terminally ill. I would note that Switzerland is the only country um, who has assisted dying out with the realms of healthcare, where it's um, primarily volunteers who facilitate the process. By contrast, the lower frequency in the United States, which is typically less than 1%, is explained by the tighter criteria and the requirement that the patient obtains the medication from the pharmacy for self-administration in their own time. So again, if you take a common sense approach to this, if you're in Belgium and you're arranging an assisted death, you have that appointment with the doctor, receive your assisted death, and that's that. In Oregon, 36% of patients who are given the medication to then take in their own time don't take it and die of the underlying illness. Therefore, we know that legalising assisted dying and not euthanasia and legalising it only for terminally ill people seems to limit the number of assisted deaths and their increase with time. In any case, with any new measure, as time passes, it becomes first tolerated and then accepted. So it's normal for uptake to increase as society becomes more accustomed to it. The seventh claim is that vulnerable people are forced into assisted dying. So throughout the world, the, the data shows us that people who access assisted dying are typically between 65 and 85. Over 70% of them have cancer and they choose assisted dying in their final days of life. 
in jurisdictions where it is legal, there is no evidence that potentially vulnerable groups, such as the over 85s, disabled people, people of low socioeconomic status, racial or ethnic minorities, or those with mental health problems are adversely affected. And whilst those people, perhaps with the exception of people with mental health issues, we should all enjoy equal access to the law, they are underrepresented in the figures. And this has been shown in studies by Peggy Batten, Penny Lewis, Ben Colburn and others. And again, I'm happy to provide references on this. Requests typically come from people who are well educated, have retained sharp mental faculties and are financially comfortable. They generally have a long held philosophical belief in assisted dying and they wish to have control and avoid unnecessary suffering. It's not a knee jerk reaction. Research by Sue Westwood and Naomi Richards with people nearing death in the UK shows that the vast majority both comprehend and want the choice of assisted dying and those who had seen others die a bad death were particularly convinced. However, despite the empirical data showing that the law operates safely and sensibly, people still have genuine concerns and it's our responsibility to maintain an open dialogue with these groups and factor in safeguards that can reassure them without hindering the objective of this proposal. And we are in conversation um, with those groups. I'll just cover off a handful of other common myths. So the eighth one is the good old slippery slope that once passed the safeguards we relied upon to gain support to get this proposal over the line will be eroded over time. For instance, the opposition often mention waiting periods being removed. Oregon's law, first of all, required terminally ill patients to make two requests separated by a 15-day waiting period. Thereafter, they had to wait another 48 hours to receive the prescription. This was only very recently changed for people who are expected to die within that 15-day waiting period to be able to bypass that. And of course, the opposition said that this was safeguards being eroded. But in reality, after 20 years, it was democratically assessed that people typically request assisted dying in their very final days. So it brought relief to gravely ill people while still complying with all the other safeguards in the law. I'll come on to Canada now because we are hearing more and more about Canada and the slippery slope there. Canada have evolved very much from through a, a journey. So the journey went from the courts to parliament, back to the courts and then back to parliament. And along this journey, the eligibility criteria, procedural safeguards and monitoring, monitoring regime have changed. So this isn't about us basically saying this doesn't happen, that doesn't happen. It's about, I suppose, equipping yourselves with the information to then go and rebut this in, in an appropriate way. So after years of legal action, public, academic and parliamentary scrutiny, they now have a regime, a permissive regime, that aligns with the eligibility criteria that was demanded of them by their Supreme Court. So the Carter v Canada case ruled that it was unconstitutional for Canada not to allow assisted dying. The court ordered their parliament to act, which they can do in that jurisdiction. Again, referring back to that couldn't happen here in Scotland because our parliament is sovereign. But that was why there was this ping pong effect between parliaments and the courts and this erosion of safeguards was because they were trying to essentially comply with what their Supreme Court had ordered of them. And that takes time and it takes democratic debate and deliberation. That's not a slippery slope. Professor Jocelyn Downey and colleagues at Queen's University Kingston have demonstrated that the slippery slope arguments that arise in the Canadian context fail to show that the country's policy changes constitute evidence of movement down a slippery slope or that they set up inevitable future descent down to an undesirable position. We need to again be reminded that law and healthcare is a living and breathing thing, and jurisdictions that have tweaked their laws over the years have done so democratically, and after careful reflection and analysis of it working in practice, just as with other areas of healthcare, like the removal of using mesh or varicose vein surgery, for example, and other jurisdictions have tweaked it to include further safeguards that weren't originally lit written into their law. For example, in Belgium, um, a consultation with a palliative care expert isn't written into the statute, but many hospitals, as medics have adopted it in practice, impose a sort of palliative filter um, in addition to the statutory criteria. 
It's Parliament's duty to consider the legislation proposed in front of them, not to hypothesise what may be. And I've put here, clairvoyancy isn't in the job description there, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so even if there were very few cases of the law not working to the letter worldwide, it doesn't justify withholding the right from everyone. If that was the case, much more than assisted dying would be prohibited. In any case, we know that banning practices doesn't eliminate them, it pushes them underground. We do know that assisted dying is happening in Scotland, but in an unsafe and unregulated way. And what the opposition seem to miss is that their steadfast support for the status quo isn't an argument against assisted dying, but it's an argument for unregulated assisted dying. So both positive and negative lessons can be learned from international comparisons, and as with any new area of healthcare or law, you know, we're in a very fortunate position, as Liam said, that We've had so much groundwork put in, and there are now so many other countries throughout the world who have gone before us. The last bill was criticised for having significant flaws and being poorly drafted, but now, with over 20 years worth of research, data, and anecdotal evidence, um, the team working behind this bill, people like yourselves backing it, we're now in a position to draft the best possible law for Scotland, and I'm confident that this time we can get it over the line. Thank you.